Bon alors, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, Procure en Parle. For those who are joining us for the first time, Procure is a not-for-profit organization like the Canadian Cancer Society, except that we are entirely dedicated to prostate cancer. And since information is the first remedy, Procure offers a monthly webinar on various topics uh, to learn all about this disease, which affects 12 men every day in Quebec. Uh, today, we will discuss genetic predisposition to prostate cancer and whether or not gene genetic testing is for you with Evan Weber, genetic counselor at the MUHC, that is the McGill University Health Center. So thank you so much, Evan, for accepting our invitation tonight. Um, we will have a presentation by our specialist, followed by a question period. Speaking of question, um, thank you for those who uh, have actually sent their questions in advance. Otherwise, you can submit them using the QA button at the bottom of your screen, and they will be read during the question period. Now, this being said, um, if you are French speaking and you wish to ask questions in French, they will be answered in French as well, for um, Evan Weber is actually bilingual. Now, before we start, uh, we would like to thank all our donors from the bottom of our hearts, of course. Um, our longtime partner, the Association uh, en fait, de l'Association des Urologues du Québec, or the uh, Quebec Urologists Association, and co-presenters of this webinar, Astellas, AstraZeneca, and Merck, as well as Bayer Laboratories, which, among others, are involved in the treatment of more advanced and aggressive prostate cancers. So thank you for your support. Now, without any further delay, I turn the floor to you, Evan, and you can actually share your screen. Thanks. Fantastic. So I will uh, share my screen. All right, so you should all be able to see my presentation at this point. Uh, Matt Kirstein, you can let me know if there's any issues. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much to Procure and to Matt Kirstein for inviting me to speak to you today. I think it's a, a really interesting time for uh, medical genetics and prostate cancer organizations to join together. Uh, I guess I'd like to start off this presentation by uh, disclosing that I don't consider myself an expert in prostate cancer genetics. And I think that is because there are very few people right now in medical genetics who consider them, themselves experts in prostate cancer. I would say that within the past few years, prostate cancer has been a quite a small proportion of our practice in the cancer genetics clinic. And it's really been in the last three to five years, and particularly in the past six months, where we've seen a greater preponderance of referrals uh, to our clinic for prostate cancer. So it's been a steep learning curve for us for the past few years. And I think that there's still a lot for us to learn, but I think it'll be a really interesting uh, you know, start to, uh, to sort of merge our two groups. And I'm really looking forward to speaking to you today about uh, genetic predisposition to prostate cancer. So this is a, a very broad and a long topic and I obviously cannot go into everything. So we figured we would do about a 30 to 40 minute presentation and leave a lot of time for questions at the end. I'll be talking a little bit briefly about certain topics, but if you'd like me to elaborate on anything, just use the Q and A function and ask any questions and I'll go over uh, anything in more detail closer to the end. So to start off, um, just a general outline. I'll be talking in general about cancer in terms of genetics and risk factors. I'll move on to genetic counseling and genetic testing. I'll talk a little bit about the most common cancer predisposition syndromes that predispose towards prostate cancer. I'll talk a little bit about genetic testing, the implications for yourself and for your family. And of course, I'll finish off with some question and answers. So to start off, I'm sure it is not a surprise to anybody in this audience that cancer is unfortunately very common. The Canadian Cancer Statistics these days quote that nearly one in two Canadians will develop cancer in their lifetime with a risk that's a little bit higher for men than for women. And again, no surprise to anybody who's watching this, I'm sure, prostate cancer is the most common cancer among men, accounting for about one in nine men in the population who will develop a prostate cancer, followed by lung cancer, followed by colorectal cancer, and the numbers are similar in women, although breast cancer is the number one cancer there instead of prostate cancer. So obviously something that is quite common in the general population. So what are the risk factors for cancer in general? And I like to break it down when talking to my patients into two different categories, modifiable risk factors or things that we can change versus non-modifiable risk factors, which are things that we are unable to change. 
So things that are modifiable would be things like exposure to tobacco, the amount of alcohol we consume, uh, our diet, whether we have an unhealthy diet, whether we are obese or not, um, physical inactivity, and exposure. So things like exposures to carcinogens uh, at work or something of that nature. So all of those things are things that we can do that we can control a little bit, some more than others, that may be able to reduce or increase our risk of developing a cancer. Although, of course, even if we live a perfectly healthy life, unfortunately, cancer is insidious and it can still occur. There are obviously some things that are non-modifiable as well. So one thing we know is cancer is a disease uh, that typically occurs more frequently in individuals who are older. So, you know, just by the, the process of getting older, our risk of developing cancer does increase. Uh, you know, gender obviously is something that, you know, on a biological level cannot be, uh, cannot be controlled. And we do know that risks for biological men are a little bit higher than biological women. And obviously the cancer profiles differ between the two genders. Uh, ethnic background is a, is a determinant in whether someone may be at higher or lower risk for certain cancers. So some cancers are more common in certain populations versus others. Other health conditions. So uh, a classic example of this would be someone who has pancreatitis or longstanding inflammation of the pancreas may have a higher risk of developing pancreas cancer. And then what I've bolded today, obviously, is my specific area of interest, which is genetics. And one thing that's important to note is that genetics does not always just refer to the fact that we're talking about, you know, high risk hereditary cancer syndromes that we'll be discussing in detail today. But genetics refers just to the fact that things do run in families. Um, and we know that anytime there is cancer in someone's family, it does increase their risk more than someone who does not have that type of cancer in their family. So genetics is a very broad and complex uh, sort of section here, and I'll try and break it down into the simplest topics for us today. So let's break down what cancer is in general. And, uh, you know, I've watched some of, other, some of these other lectures and people have described this probably better than I will today. Uh, but basically, cancer is a disease of DNA. So if anybody has actually seen me in my clinic in person, they've probably seen a picture like the one that I have on the slide here today. And I tell patients that our bodies are made up of cells, the building blocks of our body, billions and billions of these cells. Inside our cells, if you look along this picture over here, you can see this typical double helix structure, which is called DNA. And specific regions of our DNA are called genes. And genes are the instructions to our body that tell us how to grow, to function, to develop, to be healthy human beings. And as you can see in this picture, our genes are composed of letters. They have their own alph alphabet. And as you can imagine, when the letters are spelled correctly, in general, the genes work the way that they're supposed to, and it keeps us healthy. However, sometimes there can be changes or spelling mistakes, or the word that we use in genetics would be a mutation in a gene which stops the gene from working. So cancer occurs when we have a mutation in a gene, specific specifically in a specific tissue of the body. So these are typically not mutations that someone is born with. These are mutations that typically just occur completely by chance in, for example, the cells of the prostate. And typically the body's pretty good about going in and correcting these mutations and making sure they don't proliferate. But sometimes these mutations are not caught and we can develop more and more of these mutations and the cells start to divide uncontrollably and spread into other tissues. And that's when uh, a cancer can develop. So really, you know, all cancer is genetic in nature. And typically these mutations occur sporadically, specifically in the tissue itself. Where we come in, in the hereditary cancer clinic, is we are not looking for mutations that occur specifically in a tumor, but we're looking for, for mutations that somebody is born with that would typically come from a parent and could be passed on to future generations, which could increase someone's risk of developing cancer themselves. So like I said, all cancer arises from genetic mutations. But one thing to note is that genetic is not the same as hereditary. So sometimes, you know, even myself, I'll, uh, I'll use these terms interchangeably, but genetic is not necessarily equal hereditary. All cancer is genetic. Not all cancer is hereditary. In fact, most cancer is not hereditary. So I like to break it down to this approximate pie chart that I have over here on my slide. And you can see there's three categories for what we can call the causes of cancer. Number one would be what we call sporadic cancer which accounts for about 70 to 80% of cancer diagnoses in the general population. So these are cancers that typically occur at an older age of onset. Typically, there may not be a, a, a strong family history of these cancers. Um, you know, these are the cancers that really just kind of happen. They happen by chance. They can happen because of exposures, 
Um, but really, you know, these are not the ones where we tend to see a strong family history. We're not seeing them at a young age. Like I said, they're the cancers that kind of just happen. So that's the, the vast majority. A second category would be familial cancer, which accounts for about 15 to 20% of cases of cancer. And these are cases where in a family, we may see uh, more cancer than we would expect to see occurring in the general population in a family. The cancers are not really particularly occurring at a young age. Um, you know, there may be clustering of these cancers in the family, but not according to any specific pattern that we may recognize in the next category that I'll be discussing. And the cause for these types of cancers tends to be what we call multifactorial, in that in the same family, we tend to share, of course, many of the same genetic factors. And I'm not just talking about one single gene, but I'm talking about a very complex interaction of many different genes, interacting with the fact that in the same family, we share many of the same environmental factors. And again, these environmental factors can be things that we can control, such as diet and exercise, versus things that we have no control over. Um, so that would be a second category. But really where we come in as the hereditary cancer clinic is we're looking for these five to 10% of cancers that are what we call hereditary, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as genetic cancers. And these are cancers that occur due to what we call a hereditary cancer syndrome or a gene mutation that someone is born with that could be passed on from generation to generation. And if somebody inherits one of these mutations or these syndromes, it puts them at an increased risk of developing certain types of cancers. So in our clinic, we are really trying to find these families that fall into these five to 10% cases so that we can use this information to really try and keep them and their family as healthy as possible. So I put a little red flag here because these are the red flags that we're looking for um, in our patients that come and see us in our clinic. So people who are diagnosed with cancer at an earlier age than we would expect to see in the general population. So for example, a breast cancer under age 35, that is quite young for breast cancer to be diagnosed. All patients with breast cancer under 35 should come and see us in our clinic. Uh, a family history of related cancers. So if we use prostate cancer as an example, if there are other prostate cancer cancers in the family, um, you know, we, we do tend to expect to see prostate cancer occurring in a family because it's just so common in the general population. But if we see three or more cases in a close family, that would be a red flag for us. But also we're looking for other cancers that occur in the same genetic conditions as prostate cancer, which I'll discuss later on. There are specific types of cancers or specific tumor features that would suggest that maybe cancer is hereditary and people diagnose with multiple primary cancers themselves. So for example, uh, bilateral breast cancer, breast cancer in both breasts, uh, prostate cancer and male breast cancer in the same person. All of those would be clues that would say, maybe this could be hereditary. This person should come to the hereditary cancer clinic and come and see us. So let's zero in on prostate cancer today. Um, I've talked about a little bit of this already, but let's zoom in on prostate cancer. So as I mentioned, about one in nine Canadian men develop prostate cancer. And uh, most prostate cancer remains localized in that it stays pretty much within the prostate and doesn't spread to other areas of the body. But a subset of these prostate cancers are aggressive and may metastasize and spread to other areas of the body, which obviously would, uh, would have many complications. So what are risk factors for prostate cancer? I mean, I mentioned a lot of them already in terms of just the natural process of aging. Most prostate cancer occurs after age 60. We do know that regardless of whether there's a hereditary cancer syndrome or not, having a family history of prostate cancer will increase the risk of prostate cancer for other members of the family. Having a first degree relative, such as a brother or a father with prostate cancer, already about doubles your risk. So regardless of any, if, if, whether any genetic testing is done or not, having that family history is sufficient to say that someone's risk is elevated and they should discuss uh, prostate cancer screening with their family doctors. We do know that prostate cancer does vary based on ethnic background. And for reasons that we don't really know for, for sure, um, individuals of West African and Caribbean uh, backgrounds have a higher risk of prostate cancer than other uh, populations of the world. Of course, lifestyle, um, some of those modifiable risk factors that I discussed could play a role in, uh, in why someone may have prostate cancer. And really what I'm gonna spend the majority of this talk talking about is hereditary cancer syndromes as I discussed. And again, I want to reiterate the fact that most prostate cancer is not hereditary. We are talking about a small subset of prostate cancers. And this is especially true if the prostate cancer is localized. We do know that the chance that it is hereditary is higher if the prostate cancer is metastatic or aggressive. So let's talk a little bit about the genetic testing process for prostate cancer. And a classic question would be, you know, I have prostate cancer, should I get tested? 
So in Quebec, and actually in many areas of, of North America and the world right now, there are no clear guidelines for who should or should not get tested uh, for hereditary cancer syndromes if they have prostate cancer. So rather than giving you a hard and fast rule, I'm giving you some suggestions of consider if. So I have prostate cancer, should I get tested? Consider this if you have prostate cancer and a close family history of people with early onset or multiple breast cancers. So if there is someone in the family who had a breast cancer at a young age, someone who had um, bilateral breast cancer, or if there really happens to be quite a few breast cancers in the family, consider asking for a referral. If there's anybody in the family with ovarian cancer or pancreas cancer at any age, consider asking for a referral. Or if there are two or more additional diagnoses of prostate cancer in the close family for a total of three or more. So all of those would be red flags that could say, maybe it's hereditary. Most cases of people in the scenarios like I'm mentioning will not have a hereditary reason for the prostate cancer, but all the people that I mentioned in this category probably should come and see our clinic to get, it, to get evaluated. Individuals who have prostate cancer and who are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent or European Jewish descent should definitely consider genetic testing because the most common hereditary cancer syndrome that predisposes towards prostate cancer is more common in the European Jewish population. So we do have a lower threshold for testing for people of that population because the risks are higher from the beginning. So anybody who has prostate cancer who has a known hereditary cancer syndrome already in the family. So if somebody else in the family has already had genetic testing and a mutation was found, then of course this person should come in and consider testing. But I would also say that that is also available to anybody who does not even have cancer. So if there is a hereditary cancer syndrome in the family, you know, no need to wait for someone to develop a cancer by themselves they can request a referral to genetics and get tested for the mutation in the family. And the idea behind that is to prevent them from developing a cancer or to catch a cancer early that could uh, eventually become more aggressive. And the last point here is actually one that's quite new. Uh, so typically hereditary cancer syndromes when um, you know, evaluating whether someone should be tested was based on, um, on family history information, on ethnic background, things of that nature. But within the past few, few months, a few years, um, there's been a push for genetic testing for prostate cancer for individuals for treatment purposes. And I'll talk a little bit about this later on in the discussion, but anybody with metastatic prostate cancer, prostate cancer that's considered intraductal or cribriform histology, you can ask your doctor if you fall into that category, if it's a high or a very high risk group. So if the, the Gleason score is high at any age for whom testing would affect treatment, can request a referral to genetics or can request genetic testing. Um, less so because the risk of having a hereditary cancer gym is high, but more so because there are some treatment options available. And I'll go into that a little bit later and I'm sure I'll get some questions about that as well. So what happens at a genetics appointment? So first things first is someone who would need to be referred to our clinic. So for prostate cancer, referrals typically come to us by urologist or by oncologist, but we get referrals from anybody. Family doctors can refer to their patients. Really, it can come from anybody. So once a patient is referred, um, they get put on our wait list, which we triage our patients according to urgency. And eventually once the patient's turn to be seen, they meet with us. So typically prior to the pandemic, we would do these in, we would do these in person face-to-face -face at the hospital. Uh, due to the pandemic, we've shifted to basically a 100% virtual model where we see our patients either by phone or uh, by teleconsultation, by Zoom or Microsoft Teams or another secure technology. And we always start off by taking a medical and a family history intake. So we're asking detailed questions about someone's medical history, about their family history, we're drawing out a family tree. And the idea here is that we're looking for those red flags that could suggest that something is hereditary. And that comes into the next part where we do our own little hereditary cancer risk assessment, where again, myself and my colleagues will look at the history and, tell it and, and be able to tell the patients whether we think there is a high risk, a moderate risk, or a low risk of a hereditary cancer syndrome. At that point, we'll explain to the patient what we think, we'll educate them about genetics, we'll educate them about you know, what our impression is, and we'll counsel them about what that means. And then we'll provide them with medical recommendations, which may or may not include genetic testing. Many patients who have cancer who do come into our clinic are offered testing, but there are individuals for whom we say that the risk of the hereditary cancer syndrome is very low, and there is no testing indicated, particularly in a public health system like ours. And testing is, was, you know, until this year, typically done via a blood sample, where they take the blood sample and the result is typically ready about one to three months later. But due to the pandemic, we've actually shifted to using saliva samples as well. So patients don't necessarily have to come into the hospital for testing if they don't want to. 
So that really is sort of a, the genetics appointment en bref. Um, one question I get myself is, you know, what is a genetic counselor or what is genetic counseling? So I figured I would take a slide just to plug my profession a little bit because we are very small, but we are very proud. So genetic counseling is the process of helping people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological, and familial implications of genetic contributions to disease. And we break it down into three categories. So we interpret an individual's medical or family history to assess the chance of a disease occurring or occurring, or assessing the chance of there being, a, a, let's say, a hereditary cancer syndrome. So it's interpretation and risk assessment. Education. So we educate patients about the inheritance pattern, about genetic testing, about management options that may be available, prevention options, resources that are available, research opportunities. So we are teachers in that sense. We educate our patients. And we also have a counseling role to, the, to our job as well. Uh, where we work with patients to try and promote informed choices. For example, whether or not they're interested in genetic testing, it is not a given for some people, and help them adapt to the risk of a condition or the condition themselves. So as I'm sure you can imagine, being told that you have a condition that increases your risk of developing certain types of cancers can be very, very difficult. Or, being, or learning that you have a condition that you may have passed on to your children that may increase their risk for cancer can be very difficult as well. And we're trained in helping individuals um, adapt to this news as well. So let's talk a little bit about genetic testing. So like I said, genetic testing is done typically with a blood sample or a saliva sample. And the results can come back in three different ways. Number one would be a positive result, in which case we found what we call a mutation or on the report typically these days, someone would see the words pathogenic variant. In this case, we basically we found the cause for the cancer. So we found a genetic change, that presumably explains the personal or the family history of cancer. We can use this genetic change to make medical recommendations for the individual. So sometimes we can make treatment decisions using this result. And we can also you know, use this information to screen for additional cancers in the future that may arise. And also we can test other members of the family to see who may or may not be at risk in the family. The second category of result is what we call an uncertain result or a variant of uncertain significance, a VUS. If you know, if you have one of those results, you've seen those words before. In this case, we find a genetic change in a gene, but we're really just not sure if this variant affects the function of the gene or not. We're not sure whether this variant is uh, capable of increasing the risk for cancer in this individual, or if it really is just a nothing genetic change that has no impact on the individual and means nothing whatsoever. I will say in most cases, VUS has turned out to be nothing, but sometimes they can be reclassified in the future to being pathogenic or a mutation. So whenever we have a VUS, we typically do not use that, that result to impact someone's medical follow-up or their treatment. We typically do not test unaffected relatives, but we tell the patients to basically check back in with us in a couple of years or so because our knowledge of genetics does change quite quickly and sometimes we are able to reinterpret these things. And the last category, which is by far the most common result that we get in our clinic, is a negative result in which we do not find any mutations or VUSs. We really don't find any genetic changes that could be suspicious for causing cancer in a family. In this case, the cause of the cancer in the family could, is unexplained, could be sporadic, it could be multifactorial. Of course, no testing is perfect. There's always going to be a residual risk that there's a mutation in a gene that uh, you know, we don't know at the time or our technology can't, uh, can't predict. But typically when we are in this scenario, we say, let's leave it as is. There's limited value in testing other members of the family and surveillance for individuals and families should be dictated by their own medical history or by their family history. So I thought I would take a few minutes and talk about the most common prostate cancer predisposition syndromes. I'm going to give a quick overview of these because I can go into, I can spend an hour on each of these. But again, if anybody has any specific questions, I'm happy to go into more detail. So I thought that a nice way to represent this would be to uh, present an image from a paper from 2016. So on the right side of the screen over here, this is a pie chart of a study where they looked at men with metastatic prostate cancer and they coordinated genetic testing via large panel for all these individuals uh, and, saw, and basically tried to quantify how many of these individuals had uh, mutations in genes that could be involved in cancer predisposition and what are these genes. So as you can see here, so overall about, uh, about 11 to 12% of the men did test positive for a mutation in one of these genes. Uh, and as you can see, the largest category over here are our first syndrome that we'll be discussing, which is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, which we call HBOC. 
caused by mutations in the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 gene, which if you look at this pie chart, account for 7% and 44% of, uh, of the mutations uh, in individuals who have hereditary prostate cancer. So let's go into HBOC in a little bit more detail. This tends to be the syndrome that people would have heard of already. So like I said, HBOC stands for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, and it's caused by mutations um, that are inherited, we call them germline mutations, in the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 gene. As the name suggests, the most important cancer risks, or the most common cancer risks, occur in women, and the risks are for female breast cancer and for cancer of the ovary. As you can see by this graph here, for female breast cancer, the risks are about 70% lifetime for both BRCA1 and BRCA2. And for ovarian cancer, they're higher in BRCA1 than they are in BRCA2. Prostate cancer is a bit of an interesting question because until recently, I always found it difficult to find good risk factors for what the risks are for prostate cancer in BRCA1 and BRCA2. I've typically been quoting around 10 to 20% for BRCA1 and 20 to 40% for BRCA2. Uh, historically, there were some questions about whether even in BRCA1, whether prostate cancer risk was actually increased. You know, you may remember that uh, we talk about one in nine people in the general population getting prostate cancer, which equates to about 11 to 12% anyways. But I'll show you some data um, on the next slide, which suggests that it may be a little bit higher than we previously thought. Uh, there is an increased risk for male breast cancer in both BRCA1 and BRCA2, but as you can tell, by, this, by this, the, this chart over here, the risks are much lower than the other cancers. And primarily for BRCA1 and BR, for, sorry, for BRCA2, uh, there is an increased risk for pancreas cancer and melanoma. We don't have great numbers to provide to individuals. We do say that it is increased and we tend to base our screening more on family history. So like I said, I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about the risk for prostate cancer in BRCA1 and BRCA2. And what I wanted to do is uh, pull up a paper that was published uh, this year in 2020 in European Urology. So in our clinic um, and in you know, medicine in general, we pull our information and our data from the medical literature. So these are papers that are published by, uh, by medical experts that are reviewed by other medical experts that are questioned. And really this data is really vetted before it comes online. So this is a paper that comes from a group of experts that really looked prospectively. So looked at men who have mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. And the question was, how many of them will develop cancer, prostate cancer particularly, if we watch them for a few years? So if you look at the graph on the right over here, you can see that for um, there are two lines. The bottom line is BRCA1 risk. And the, second, and the top line is the BRCA2 risk. So if you look at the x-axis, the left to right, we're talking about age and years. Now, if we're talking about the y-axis, top to bottom, we're talking about the likelihood of developing prostate cancer. So if you follow this line here, you can see that before age 45 and at age 45, the risk of developing prostate cancer in both BRCA1 and BRCA2 is very, very, very low. You know, we still can't say it's zero because these things do occur, but it's very, very low. If you follow these two lines, you can see that the BRCA2 risk starts to rise a little bit faster than the BRCA1 uh, line. And uh, by age 75, the risk of developing prostate cancer in BRCA2 is thought to be about 27%. And in BRCA1, a little bit lower, looks to be at around 20% or so. So again, in line with our thought, BRCA2 risks tend to be higher than BRCA1. The big difference seems to occur but after age 75, between age 75 and age 80. Um, in this study, they found that the risk in BRCA1 is 29% to age 85 um, and 60% in BRCA2. I'm not 100% sure that I buy into this data yet. It still is a small study and nothing else has been replicated. And I don't want a, a take home message of this presentation to be that the risk for prostate cancer in BRCA2 is 60%. What I do want to take home is that we know in both BRCA1 and BRCA2, there is an increased risk of prostate cancer, about a two to five fold increased risk. The risk is strongly influenced by the number of family members with prostate cancer. Particularly for BRCA2, prostate cancer tends to be more aggressive than people who have prostate cancer and don't have a BRCA2 mutation. And like I said, that 60% number and even that 29% number seem to be higher than previously reported. And we do question about whether this is just the fact that, you know, we were screening these people for prostate cancer where we wouldn't have been doing so if they didn't have the mutation. So I'm going to kind of rush through what some of the management recommendations are. Um, 
but just to basically touch on this, for a woman who has a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation, we do recommend starting breast surveillance at about age 25, uh, and we add on uh, additional screening as of age 30. And as some of you may have heard, you know, BRCA1 is the Angelina Jolie gene. Um, some women do opt to uh, have risk-reducing surgery to remove the breast tissue to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer the most, uh, as much as possible. For ovarian cancer, like I said, the risk in BRCA1 is higher in BRCA2. But the big difference here is that we do not have good screening technology for uh, ovarian cancer. So we do routinely recommend surgery to remove the ovaries and the fallopian tubes between age 35 and 45, depending on the gene, after someone has completed their family. For men who have a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation, um, for someone who has not had a cancer already, the big recommendation is starting screening for prostate cancer. So we recommend an annual PSA blood test and a digital rectal exam, which can be done by a family doctor, starting between age 40 to 45. Uh, in our clinic, we follow the recommendations of uh, a group of researchers called the IMPACT study, who recommend using a more um, uh, a, a lower threshold for the PSA than some other groups do. So we would recommend using 3.0 nanograms per milliliter as, the, uh, as a threshold for being called a positive result for a PSA. And the idea being that if someone has a PSA that's higher than that, then they may consider doing a prostate biopsy, which we want to avoid unless necessary. And again, just given the fact that the risks are higher in BRCA2, we recommend that this is a stronger recommendation for BRCA2 than for BRCA1. For the risk of male breast cancer, we don't have major recommendations. A man can definitely consider going for a clinical breast exam with a family doctor every year just to feel around and see if there's anything unusual. We do stress breast awareness. So a man who does have a BRCA1 or particularly a BRCA2 mutation, you know, once a month in the shower to feel around if there is a lump in the breast area or in the armpit, maybe have a lower threshold for seeing their family doctor about it than they would if they did not have a mutation. And for other cancers that could be seen in BRCA1 and BRCA2, we really do basis on the family history and we don't have major recommendations other than avoiding risk factors. And like I said, we do, uh, you know, target this based on someone's family history of cancer. So just to talk about some other uh, hereditary cancer syndromes that could predispose towards prostate cancer, one that comes up quite a bit is Lynch syndrome. So Lynch syndrome is a different hereditary cancer syndrome caused by a mutation in four genes, three of which we can see in the pie chart over here, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. And if you look at the pie chart, PMS2 is over here, 2%, MSH2 is 1%, MSH6 is 1%. These do not account for a large proportion of hereditary prostate cancers. But Lynch syndrome is a condition that predisposes primarily to gastrointestinal, so primarily colorectal, gynecological, primarily uterus, and genitourinary, so cancers of the urinary tract. Um, and the risks are quite high, primarily for colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer. So those are definitely the big things to think about for someone who has Lynch syndrome. In this condition, we think that the prostate cancer risk is elevated depending on the specific gene, but it is uncertain. We don't have great numbers. And like I said, it does vary based on the gene. So right now, if you look at a lot of the, um, the, the groups who recommend surveillance modalities for people who have these conditions, Right now, many of the groups say that there is insufficient evidence to recommend prostate cancer surveillance routinely for all men with Lynch syndrome. We do tend to base this on the family history alone. So if someone has Lynch syndrome and a family history of prostate cancer, that's a no brainer, they should be considering surveillance. But for all men with Lynch syndrome, they can discuss with their family doctors or the urologist if they have one, the benefits and limitations of screening for prostate cancer if they have Lynch syndrome and consider doing so at that point. And you know, hopefully within the next few years, we'll have better guidelines about what uh, the actual risks are and what our recommendations are for prostate cancer screening and Lynch syndrome. I wanted to quickly touch on HOXB13. Uh, you'll notice that it is not present in the chart on the right over here because it is extremely rare. The only reason that I mentioned this is because HOXB13 is the only condition at this time that we know is really a pure prostate cancer predisposition gene. We don't think it predisposes to anything else. We really, in these families, tend to see multiple prostate cancers occurring at a young age. They tend to be more aggressive. And like I said, they tend to have a lot of family history of prostate cancer. I've never seen a case of this. I don't know anybody who's ever seen a case of this, but I do mention it because we tend to test for this. Although, like I said, I've never personally seen it before. And last but not least, I wanted to touch on what we call moderate penetrance genes. 
So things like HBOC and Lynch syndrome are what we call high risk conditions in which the risk of developing cancer is thought to be significantly higher than the general population. There is a group of genes that we call moderate penetrance genes in which the risk of developing cancer in these conditions are higher than the general population, but not to the same extent that we see in those high risk conditions. So CHECK2, ATM, PALB2, RAD51D, these are all genes that you can see popping up in this graph over here and actually account for a pretty high proportion of these conditions. In all of these conditions, there is a suspected risk for prostate cancer, but no agreed upon risk figures or management recommendations. A lot of these genes are sort of um, more new in terms of our knowledge. We've been studying them for less time. And again, you know, I've said it a few times that prostate cancer is so common that it's sometimes very difficult for us to really ascertain whether a prostate cancer that occurs in someone who has a CHECK2 mutation is it caused by the CHECK2 mutation or did it just happen in someone who has that mutation because cancer is so common? So again, we kind of take this case by case. We look at the family history, we look at the specific mutation and we really discuss with the patient in front of us. I thought I'd finish off this talk by talking a little bit about the personal and familial implications of testing. So what does it mean for someone and their family if they do have testing? So for someone who tests positive for hereditary cancer syndrome, What's interesting is for the first time that I can think of in, in quite so many years for prostate cancer, there actually is medical implications for the treatment for someone who tests positive for, uh, for, for uh, hereditary cancer syndrome, particularly for BRCA1 and BRCA2. So there is what we call targeted maintenance therapy. So for a man who has a, who has a prostate cancer, um, metastatic, castration resistant, and has either a germline or a somatic, a mutation located only to the tumor, in BRCA1, BRCA2, or another gene called ATM, they are eligible to have this new class of drugs called PARP inhibitors. The main drug that we talk about these days that's approved by Health Canada is Olaparib. And really, this is a drug that really tries to slow down the metastasis of a cancer. And we know these drugs do work better in people who have these mutations. This is not widely used in Canada yet. It's only been recently approved by Health Canada. I'm not sure exactly about what the funding is like by RAMQ for these. I know that some of the companies that market these drugs have some passion de exception programs, um, but for someone who does have a metastatic castration resistant cancer with a BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM mutation can definitely discuss whether they may be able to access this drug with their urologist or their oncologist. And of course, for someone who tests positive, um, we can offer personalized screening for additional cancer risks. So for a man for prostate cancer who tests positive for a BRCA2 mutation, we would recommend screening for male breast cancer. We would look at their family history to see if there's anything else going on, such as pancreas cancer, and provide them with recommendations based on that. So I've been talking a lot today about what the implications are for the individual, but a huge part of our practice is talking about members of the family. So for someone who tests positive for hereditary cancer syndrome, the next step is we're able to offer genetic counseling and testing to other members of the family to provide them with a personalized cancer risk assessment. This is important to note because this is available to male and female relatives of an individual who tests positive. And not only can it tell us who is at risk, but it can also tell us who in the family may not be at risk. So we can also reduce someone's risk uh, or provide them with a reduced risk of getting cancer by testing other people. So all the hereditary cancer syndromes that I've discussed today are inherited in what we call autosomal dominant manner, in that typically they come from one of the two parents who may or may not have had a cancer themselves. It can equally come from mom or from dad. It doesn't sort of preferably come from one member of the family. And for every time that an individual with a mutation has a child, there is a 50% chance of passing it on and a 50% chance of not passing it on. So for a man who has a BRCA2 mutation, Every time he has a child, there is a 50% chance that the child will inherit the mutation and thus have increased risk for cancer, but also a 50% chance of not passing it on and thus not having an increased risk for cancer. And we can easily do that with a genetic test, typically by blood or saliva. And I will just take this moment just to plug the fact that for a family who is concerned that there may be a hereditary cancer syndrome in their family, based on a strong family history, for example, it's always best to first see an individual in our clinic in the family who has had a cancer diagnosis themselves. That is the best person to start with testing in the family. And if we do find a mutation in that person, then the next step would be to offer testing to other people in the family. We know it's not always possible, 
Obviously, people are passed away. People may not be interested in testing, but that is definitely the ideal scenario. So to conclude, I think I was good on timing today. We have lots of time for questions. I wanted to just give you some take home messages. Most prostate cancer is not hereditary. Again, about five to 10% is. A family history of prostate cancer confers an increase to family members, even if it's not hereditary. So even if the testing comes back negative, people should still consider screening if they have a family history of prostate cancer. Consider genetic testing if the prostate cancer is metastatic or if there's a family history of multiple or early onset cancers. And genetic testing for prostate cancer can impact treatment and medical follow-up and can have important medical implications for both male and female family members. And I wanted to leave you with this last slide over here. One, because I just find it very funny. But two, uh, you know, I talked a lot today about the, uh, the medical implications of testing, but it's always important to recognize that we have humans in front of us and genetic testing is a very human issue. And every time I offer testing to a patient, I do recognize that I'm providing with information that could really change their life in that it does provide them with uh, the knowledge of an increased risk for cancer. And once someone knows about that increased risk, there is no way of putting that back in. And you know, as genetic counselors, we are especially trained in helping individuals decide whether, they not, whether or not they want the testing and really how to help manage that and really try and keep them and their family members as healthy as possible. So on that note, I wanted to say thank you for listening to me today. I look forward to take your questions. Um, Evan Weber, I think you've just uh, taken our breath away, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, I think people are still trying to put together their questions. I've I do recognize that I speak quite quickly. <laughs> no, but the, the, the webinar is actually the, the content and everything you've spoken about is so interesting and it's so much to absorb because um, I think it's the first time that people are actually exposed, not only to your role, but actually what's coming to with regards to uh, prostate cancer treatments um, when you actually have a you know, genetic predisposition. Um, one of the question I'm going to ask you is bec because we, we get that question often. Uh, and I know you've talked about it and it doesn't matter if you repeat the answer here. It's with regards to the fact that father has prostate cancer diagnosed at an early age. It was, it was quite aggressive. Um, however, he did not necessarily pass away within the two, three or four years following diagnosis. Um, brother, has had a diagnosis of prostate cancer as well. So we're talking about two people in the family. So the third person asking the question is, should he get genetic testing? Because you've talked a little bit earlier about normally when we look at family history, we're looking at three or four more cases of you know, prostate cancer diagnosis. Here we have two. And then one of the brother is just wondering all right, is it hereditary? Is it familial? Is it, I think there's a, still a little bit of confusion here. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think the take home from that scenario there is someone who has two brothers with prostate cancer, regardless of whether there is any genetic testing that's done or not, that person does have a significant increased risk of developing prostate cancer. So like I mentioned, just having one first degree relative with prostate cancer, automatically doubles your risk of getting prostate cancer. Having two would, would increase it even more. I don't have the number off the top of my head. So regardless, that third brother should speak to their family doctor about having prostate cancer screening, um, be it a PSA or a rectal exam. The question of genetic testing is definitely interesting. So like I said earlier, um, you know, until let's say the past, even the past two to three years, we really did not see many patients um, referred to our clinic for genetic assessment for prostate cancer. Um, and historically, if there were just two individuals in the family with prostate cancer, we would probably say that genetic testing is not indicated in that scenario, given that there is still a very low chance that this could be hereditary. Like I mentioned, most prostate cancer is not. It's really when we start seeing three or more individuals in a family that we start to be a bit more suspicious. Although like I can, I, I can tell you that in most family families where there are three or more cases, we still don't find anything. But what I can tell you is that 
over the past couple of years, our criteria for offering genetic testing has relaxed a little bit, primarily due to the fact that testing is a lot cheaper now than it used to be. The price has really dropped down significantly. Um, and uh, you know the fact that there are now treatment options that are available for men with prostate cancer, that's also relaxed our criteria as well. So if someone does have a metastatic or a high Gleason prostate cancer, that would be a reason to be referred to genetics. So overall, that family, you know, it's not super high risk. Historically, we wouldn't see them in our clinic. You know, maybe these days we may be a little bit more relaxed in, in offering this family some testing. But regardless, that third brother is at increased risk of prostate cancer, regardless of testing, and should be discussing screening with his doctor. Um, speaking of this, uh, we had a call this week, as a matter of fact, <laughs> this week. I really mean it. And uh, the, the person um, had a um, diagnostic of um, uh, very aggressive prostate cancer, metastatic. Um, it actually went into, it, it was actually visceral when they did the radical surgery. That's when they discovered how aggressive it was. And then within, unfortunately, three years, the person passed away. Now, this being said, it's only one person and the family should that should should it should the daughters because he, he he has left behind two daughters should they actually uh consult in genetics it's we're only talking about one person but we're talking about a very lethal prostate cancer so what should we say to this family yeah you're asking the right questions here and these are questions that we're still asking ourselves um, you know, we have meetings regularly among our teams about how to manage requests like this. So what I could say is, you know, in the event of just a single diagnosis of prostate cancer, even if it is metastatic, the likelihood that it is hereditary, so for example, caused by a BRCA2 mutation in the germline, is very low. Um, you know, we do take into account the fact that we do work in a public health system and genetic testing is very expensive. So unfortunately, you know, we're not able to offer testing to everybody who presents with a smaller family history of cancer. But we do, like I said, we definitely relaxed our criteria over the last little bit. To be honest, the question that you're asking of someone whose father died of a metastatic prostate cancer and the children are concerned about their own risks, that's actually a question that we haven't, a risk of hereditary cancer syndrome. That's a question that we haven't faced just yet. And I think um, that's something that we're definitely going to have to ask ourselves. So what I would say is if someone is in that scenario and is, you know, is curious, what they can do is they can ask for a referral to a medical genetics clinic and they would come in and see us and we'd be able to do a personalized risk assessment and see whether we think testing would be helpful or not in that scenario. I do have to say that unfortunately, um, many of the genetics clinics in Quebec are very understaffed and the demand has only been increasing over the past few years and our wait lists are very, very long for non-urgent cases. Um, but we are doing our best to try and find alternative ways to get patients seen and tested faster, particularly when there are new things like treatment implications. All right. Um, you have a couple of questions here that I want to uh, share with you. Um, well, this is from a man who uh, learned that, first of all, he's never known his father, all right? But he's learned that within his um, ex 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 estranged family, uh, there was some BRCA uh, mutation. And um, he's, he's not sure whether or not he has inherited these mutation and he was wondering if whether or not he should get uh, genetic testing. What do you think? Yeah, that's an excellent question as well. Um, so one thing that's important to note that, you know, was previously a bit of a misconception, but I think has actually been rectified over the last little bit is that mutations can equally come from mom or from dad. So either, so if someone has a mutation, it equally would have come from mom or from dad. So in this specific individual circumstance, the fact that there is a mutation present in the paternal family means that this individual could, in theory, have inherited the mutation. It depends on whether or not the father had the mutation or not. But in theory, if the father had the mutation, then there is a 50% chance that he would carry this mutation and a 50% chance that he would not carry the mutation. And I would say that for sure, if he is interested in knowing whether or not he has this mutation in order to really just uh, 
you know, best ascertain what his risks are, whether he should be following um, any specific surveillance protocols, whether his children need to be tested, he absolutely can come and see a genetics clinic. What I would encourage someone in this scenario to do would be to, you know, if there is contact with the estranged family, to see if they'd be able to get a copy of the actual genetic test report confirming what the mutation is. First of all, what gene is it? Is it BRCA1? Is it BRCA2? Is it a different gene? Uh, and also confirming what the specific name of the mutation is, because using that information, we can really provide a yes or a no answer as to whether or not he is at increased risk. So the simple answer is yes, he is possibly at risk, and yes, he could access genetic testing and counseling if he's interested. All right, now this being said, once you do um, genetic testing um, and you do get the results, are these results confidential? I mean, yeah. if someone doesn't want to share the results, let's say with an insurance company, um, are they confidential? That is a tricky question and I will do my best to answer this one. The <laughs> short answer is yes. So the genetic test results will be placed in the patient's medical file and will be as confidential as everything else in their medical file. So in theory, only medical professionals who are assigned to their care are able to access that information. Um, you know, we are not able to provide these results to other members of the family unless there is explicit permission from the person who had the testing. So for example, if I see a person who's tested positive and I got a call from the sister the next day saying, hey, can I have your results? Have my sister's results? I cannot give that without permission from the sister. Um, the question of insurance companies is an interesting one. And what I can say about that is, you know, let's say five years ago, there was a lot of concern about this because insurance companies were able to request genetic test results and use the results in terms of, you know, denying someone insurance coverage, charging them a high premium, et cetera. We do have good news here in that uh, a couple of years ago, the Canadian government passed a law called the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, which aims to prohibit what we call genetic discrimination from insurance companies. And that insurance companies are now no longer able to request that someone undergo a genetic test or to request any result of genetic testing um, when they are doing the process of determining eligibility and charging a premium. There were some questions about this over the past couple of years. It went to the Supreme Court of Canada. And just over this past summer, the Supreme Court of Canada agreed that this law will stay. So what I do tell my patients now is that there is a level of protection that insurance companies are legally not allowed to use this information. That being said, it is new. It's never been tested in court. There are always loopholes. For example, someone's family history can still be asked about. So an insurance company will still be able to ask, you know, do you have a family history of cancer? And you will be obligated to say whether or not you do have it. But there is definitely more protection now than there was with regards to um, uh, genetic test information from, from insurance companies. Well, this is extremely important information. Mm -hmm. um, um, Evan, uh, within your practice, have you seen uh, patients who have been um, actually not really open about disclosing the fact that they were carrying a mutation, an important mutation, and not necessarily willing to speak about it within their own family? And what did you do about it to encourage them to have that open discussion? I think that's a really excellent question. And that does speak to definitely one of the challenges of our, of our profession in that, you know, Number one is respecting the patient's autonomy. Um, so I have definitely experienced circumstances where I have family members who, you know, like you may have mentioned in your example earlier, that they may be estranged from their family, may not have contact with people, may refuse to share information with their family members. Um, you know, one thing we always do is we do encourage family members strongly to share their genetic test results with close family members. We provide every patient with a copy of their genetic test report. We also write up a letter saying, you know, dear members of family XYZ, someone in your family has tested positive for this condition. If you are interested in being tested for this condition, please contact us. So we provide them with sort of an anonymized letter. And we really try and provide them with as much information and comfort with telling their families about their own results. Of course, from that point on, that's all we can do. Um, we aren't able to sort of cold call members of the family to say, you know, you are at risk. We, it is unfortunately in, um, I shouldn't say unfortunately, it is in the hands of the patient about with regards to who they tell and who they don't tell. What I can tell you is the vast majority of patients that we see who do test positive for hereditary cancer syndromes, 
you know, the day after we send the results, we get five or six phone calls from members of their family asking for an appointment. So I would say it's a, it is, it is a, an issue and we do definitely struggle with this on, on our end. You know, do we have a duty to warn people who could be at risk? And there are many very, very interesting cases published in the literature and even the legal literature about what to do in that scenario. But overall, it's a minor issue. And when it does come up, obviously we discuss it among our team but overall, it would have to be very, very extreme circumstances for us to uh, to break the patient's autonomy, which has never happened in my practice. Evan, this webinar is so interesting. I mean, we could go on and go on. Um, I'm going to try to summarize with two last questions before we go to conclusion, and we only have five minutes left. Uh, the first one is, um, we've received questions on our support line saying, you know, I'm a BRCA carrier. Um, it comes from my mother. My sister had preventive surgery. Can I just actually go on hormone therapy or have radical surgery or anything to prevent having prostate cancer? What do you say to these men? Yeah, that's also a very interesting question. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that for women who have these BRCA mutations, we talk a lot about preventative surgeries and as ways to reduce the risk. I think the big difference between men and women in this scenario is that um, for the biggest surgery that we recommend is for a woman with a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation to consider having the ovaries and the fallopian tubes removed uh, after, after they've had having their family by their 40s or so. And the reason for that is we do not have good screening for ovarian cancer. And ovarian cancer, when it's diagnosed, tends to be diagnosed at a late stage already in that there really isn't very much that we can do. The big difference with prostate cancer is that we do have good options for screening, be it uh, you know, the biomarker, the PSA, or, uh, or the rectal exam, the, uh, the physical exam with the doctor. And these are really good ways to be able to detect prostate cancer at an early stage. You know, like I said, the prostate cancer that occurs in BRCA could be more aggressive than your sort of run-of-the-mill prostate cancer. But we do know that screening, the goal of that is to try and catch prostate cancer as early as possible. Um, I've personally never heard of a scenario of someone requesting surgery to remove the prostate preventatively in BRCA. I would imagine that that would not be a very popular thing to discuss, not to discuss, uh, a very... Um, something that would, that would happen frequently because the complications of that surgery seem, would seem to outweigh the, you know, the annoyance uh, of having to go in for, for scans or for screening every year. Um, you know, having a, a radical surgery to remove the prostate can come with many different issues, uh, erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence, things of that nature. Um, and that wouldn't really outweigh um, you know, the risk of getting prostate cancer when we do have good screening. I don't want to... Um, you know, reduce the fact that screening is, screening's tough, you know. I tell our patients about the term that I heard once called scanxiety or scan anxiety, which is the sort of the feeling that someone gets when uh, they're worried about having to go in for their cancer screen every single year, et cetera. And that is definitely, a, uh, you know, a big thing that we see among our patients. Um, but I would say that, you know, uh, I've never heard of a patient requ requesting a, a preventative surgery, but I don't see the doctors being excited about it, just given that the complications would be higher than, uh, than just the regular screening. Well, actually, you're absolutely right, because when the question was asked, um, clearly the answer was no. You know, you go through a very uh, a strategic screening program that is probably the best offer we can give you. But clearly no urologist or uro-oncologist would actually go through any treatments to prevent you from developing prostate cancer. Um, Quite frankly, I think we're at the end of our webinar. I said I did have another question, but uh, you know what? Uh, tomorrow we'll summarize um, this webinar in five points. And I think the last question I will just include in my summary. I really, really want to thank you, Evan. You did a wonderful job here. There's so much we still need to learn about. I mean, clearly we're going to write articles about it. We're going to update our website. Um, we know that for some medication like Olaparid, uh, you actually need to have a genetic 
testing to to qualify to have this um, to you know to, to to have this molecule to treat your your cancer. So prostate cancer here, of course. I mean, um, so um, I mean, there's a lot of work to do, and I'm really looking forward for um, you know what the future the future holds for us. Um, so all in all, I really want to thank you for this webinar. It will be available on our YouTube channel fairly shortly. Um, second of all, before you leave this webinar, just remember that we really wish to have your opinion. So when you leave, there is a button that will appear that says continue. That will lead you directly to a survey which you can actually fill. Um, for, the, for those who still want to have information about prostate cancer, our next webinar on April 12th will be on radical surgery. So um, just take note that it's going to be in French. However, you can always ask your question in English. And again, Evan, thank you so much for your precious time. It was extremely appreciated. And to all of you online, thank you very much and do have a great evening. This thank you so is, much, uh, everyone. <laughs> thank you. This is Marie-Christine from Procure en Parle. Thank you. Vous avez aimé les services de Procure? Alors n'hésitez pas à contribuer à procure.ca. Merci pour votre générosité.